Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 155. This episode is with my friend Daniel Kennedy. He's an events coordinator, an artist, a Frenchie dad, and just a super cool dude. We talk about him actually going to school to study history before becoming a master librarian, how he got into art, what exactly goes into planning big events like San Diego Comic-Con and Star Wars Celebration, designing the Ahsoka Tano jersey, his love of the Liverpool Football Club, adopting his dog Miles last year, and so much more. So, without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the Interesting Podcast, number 155, with Daniel Kennedy. Theme song time! I have like 20 Zoom meetings a day, so you? <laughs> it's just like just another day. Sure. Are you used to them yet? <clears throat> um, I mean, I've actually been working remote now. Um, well, I was unemployed for a while, but mm-hmm. um, even at the end of Lucasfilm, I had moved down to LA in October and I worked till May. Nice. So I was working remote all that time and then joined Team Liquid, and of course, we're like pretty much a hundred, like a lot of my teammates are in Kansas city. Some are in the Netherlands. Sure. Um, sure. So this is just, I'm used to working remote for whatever reason. There you go. Do you, do you prefer it? Are you at that stage yet? Mm, yes and no. Yeah. Um, there's like good parts to, to both because mm-hmm. um, remote allows you to kind of work. Like I, 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 find myself working more when I work remote because oh. um, there's that it's hard to disconnect. Sure. And, and I think it's a hard excuse for some people to be like, yeah, I can't make that meeting. Yeah. Like, well, <laughs> you know, like, well, where, where are you, are you going? <laughs> Your <Yeah>. kitchen. <laughs> yeah. That's um, a good point. You're out of excuses. <laughs> and you have a little bit more of a barrier to that when you're actually going to an office, you're like, okay, well, I got to commute home. So I got to leave at X amount of time. And then sure. people are pretty good about like, if you leave, you don't have to continue that. Right. Right. It seems like most people these days commute anyway. So you can be like, Oh, I have a drive. You know, it's like, you're not, you're not driving to your bedroom. Come on. Right. Come on. <laughs> uh, and so, but I, but I miss, um, I've, I've worked for team liquid almost six months now and I've met my boss twice in person. Oh, okay. Is that, so, is that good? <laughs> oh, I just think that's rare. Yeah, that's true. Um, our office is in, it just so happens our office is in Santa Monica where I live. So, oh, okay. Right um, on. That worked out. Nobody's allowed, nobody's allowed to go in it. So sure. Sure. How are you liking it? Cause you came from San Francisco and it's a, it's a different climate. LA I is. love LA yeah. um, in comparison. There's just, well, Ash, you know, she's lived here for 10 years now. Right. Right. Um, so she's kind of shown me around quite a bit. Nice. Uh, there's just so much to do here. Um, the weather's amazing. We're right by the beach. So sure. We, we like to bike right down to Hermosa and stuff like that and go hiking and all this amazing stuff. Nice. Nice. I was just thinking ever since I asked you uh, to, to do this, I was like, where did I, I think we met. So I remember we met virtually because I submitted a panel for creatures and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And that was what opened it. And then it was even better than I imagined the actual creature panel. And I was like, all right, cool. That works for me. Thank you. But I think we met at the Marriott because you had a, you have a Harry Potter Triwizard Cup tattoo. I do. And yeah. I think I, I remember sitting next to you and I just happened to look over and I was like, hey, I like your tattoo. <laughs> that was <laughs> the impetus of it all. <laughs> uh yeah i can't wait to go back to that and i guess we got a year and a half roughly yeah yeah and i mean you're already there so good job that'll be cool you know yeah you don't have to and go to what, snow uh i left um you know like mid planning mm-hmm. um and they had a lot of cool stuff planned for um back in august and i hope that they carry over some of that that obviously content wise it's going to be completely different sure um, sure in another year you know Obi-Wan will have 
completely filmed and yeah maybe yep. even been out by then i don't really know like what the release date is but right the, we will have had probably new completely new animation projects start to pop up sure sure yeah they're um, talking about visions and stuff it's, it's a good time it's a good time to mm -hmm. be a fan it's not bad it's not bad i'm enjoying some seltzer right now by all means i've got <laughs> uh i've got coffee in my episode two oh, perfect mug as you do as you do yeah yeah, I, I've been working nights for like almost 12 years, so I have to have coffee throughout the day to continue. Oh, it's man. A, it's an interesting existence. So do you go to work uh, a little bit after this? Yep. I don't I'm sleep, sorry. Daniel. I don't do it. Yeah. It sounds, like, <laughs> it sounds like you don't. You know, it, it's not that bad once you get the routine. That's what I find. It, like, if I took nights off, then that would be an issue because then my body's like, what are we doing? But the fact that it's every night, it's like, oh, right. Nighttime is for work. And I've been doing it for so long, you just get in that situation, you know? Yeah. It's not too bad. Not too bad. And I can't That's relax. Cool. So I'm like, what else do I need to do? Uh, acting and, and podcasts and other things. Like, I can't sit. So it works out. <laughs> so I appreciate you enabling me for all no this. problem. <laughs> but are, are you from San Francisco? No, I'm from Austin, Texas. Are you really? Yeah. I did not know that. So when did you leave? Um, I le I moved to San Diego in 2014. Oh, what are you doing there? Um, with my uh, agency job, my agency event job. So I worked for um, a company called Freeman XP for almost four years. Mm -hmm. um, and they moved me out to San Diego to be with a client. But this oh, okay. was while Lucasfilm was one of my clients. Sure. And um, they, well, Ipso facto, 11 months in, I was like really uh, upset with my company. And I was like, what are my dream jobs? And so you just start, sure. you know, like, where could I work out of anywhere in the world? You just start applying to those places. Mm -hmm. Lucasfilm happened to be one of my clients with the agency. So I helped them put on San Diego Comic Con. Oh, nice. It's good for and I went on. Yeah. And I went onto the website one day and saw that they were hiring an event person. And I contacted um, my client at the time, uh, Mary Franklin, who oh, I'm sure you're... She's yep. great. She Super wasn't working nice. at Lucasfilm. She was like, oh, I'm sorry, I left. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just Repop. missed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. And she's like, but send me a resume. You know, I know who took over um, and I'll send it to him. And then interviewed a couple months later. Um, actually, it was like right on my birthday or something like that. I found out I got hired. Nice. And then, Two weeks later, I moved to San Francisco and started my job right before, oh. um, well, it was right after, so celebration happened in April, mm -hmm. um, Anaheim that year. Yep. And I joined in June and was basically working on the Comic-Con booth that I was already working on for them. Oh, I just perfect. Switched, <laughs> switched sides. Sure. <laughs> That's and, cool. Uh, yeah, I went from agency side to client side, which I love client side. Yeah, yeah. I assume it's much less work. Oh, no, it's it's the same amount of work, oh. um, <laughs> if not more. But you get to tell people to like, hey, I need this by next week. Oh, OK. And since you're their client, they kind of kind of I mean, like within reason, right? Sure, of um, course. But that's the nice part. Being on the other side, you're like, yes, okay, sure. Well, Bend over backwards to get this thing done because you pay us a lot of money. Kind of. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's cool. It, so, are you organized, like by nature, because you're an events um, person? Professionally, um, somewhat. Okay. Um, personally, okay. not at all. Really? <laughs> I keep everything in my head. I'm really bad at writing things down, so I just keep it all in my head. Wow. Does it stay? Um, for the most part. Wow. Uh, but it also keeps me up at night. It keeps me very <laughs> tense. Sure. It's a trade-off. Sure. It's like one of those superpowers, but at the same time, it um, affects, you know, all the other parts of your life. Right, right. It's like Daredevil. It's like, it's cool, yeah, but also exactly. like you're blind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll lose sleep or like freak out if I forgot something, but, the, you know, I'll always remember it. But um, I, my goal is to try to get better at, um, just kind of keeping myself organized. Sure. Sure. I am not that way <laughs> on paper because yeah. my boss has always used to say like, well, what if you get hit by a bus? Uh, <laughs> All our information's in your head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
they're like, well, A, don't get hit by a bus. And then B, also write your stuff down and, Good start. you know, make it in, in shareable documents and things like that. So I've gotten a lot better at that. But um, for the most part, I just keep it all. That's wild. I have the memory of an Alzheimer's patient. So it's it just doesn't work at all. That's why I work with Savannah because she's organized <laughs> enough for everyone in the world. I'm like, I'll just I'll just show up. You tell me what to do and I'll just freestyle. And that's that's what we'll do. And we'll have the yeah. same conversation more than once because I'll forget we had it. So let's we'll figure it out. The partners I found help a lot. <laughs> where where uh, my memory really excels is voices. So oh okay, um, I'm very good at identifying who a voice is in a movie. Oh cool. And um, faces, not names though. It's always just oh faces. really. <laughs> I always recognize somebody and I can tell them or you know like if it's a movie I can be like oh that person was in such and such movie but remember remembering their name is super hard for me sure that's why i called everyone brother for like years yeah. <laughs> like how you doing brother? smart yeah it worked nobody knew and it's a term of endearment as well so it like doubled up I'm like yeah actors do that all the time i mean yeah. uh, they'll see you on a red carpet and they'll be like hey it's so nice to see you <laughs> and they have no idea who you are sure <laughs> <laughs> they see the twinkle in your eye and it's like yeah yeah the, uh, how you been <laughs> I've been like, yeah, we met um, before and I'm like, no, this is the first time or yeah. <laughs> they don't remember you. And you're like, yeah, we met like 10 times kind of a thing. <laughs> the thing you remember that we had, you said it was like the best day ever. You're like, yeah. right. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm glad you remember faces because that came in handy for me when I ran into you at the store. What are the odds? Yeah. Because I live in Florida and we just happened to be in San Francisco for the weekend. And then we were getting a tour. And it just worked out. That was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah so, that was a fun day. Yeah. Brought you by you. the Star Wars show. You did. Um, thank you for that. Area. That was a, a dream come true that came with a lot of questions afterwards. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not involved in the decorating decisions down there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I never was. So sure. that's all Bromley and all those people down there. They're great. They're great. They let me hold their Emmy. That was pretty cool. They're pretty heavy. Come to find out. Yeah. It was a good day. It was a good day. Very, was very talented you. group. Yeah. So thank you for that. Opening the no door problem. at least. So what was your like, because you said you had your agency first. Were you, what's the actual title? Is it like coordinator? Is it event planner? Like how, how does, what's um, it on paper? I came in as an event coordinator. That was like entry level. Okay. So sure. you want me to just start from the beginning? Actually, yeah, please. How do you? Okay. First, how do you even get into something like that? Where's the interest yes. start? <laughs> right. Um, it's so specific. Yeah. And, and actually it's, um, uh, not a funny story, but, um, I'll take it just random. Uh, so even better went to school at Texas tech university up in Lubbock. Cool. Majored in history with a, a minor in secondary education, wanted to be um, a history teacher and a really? soccer coach. Yeah. Oh, I see a thread here. Yeah. Obviously, you know about my love of soccer, which we'll, I'm sure, be discussing at some point down the mm -hmm, road. Um, mm -hmm. And started teaching in Lubbock. Um, like, oh, you made to it to get to get your teaching certificate. You have to essentially be like a, a teaching assistant to a high school. Oh, uh, teacher. okay. Cool. So you go in and you do a, a bunch of their lessons. Um, you grade a lot of the their papers and things like that, mm -hmm. and also do a lot of stuff just by yourself while the teacher watch. It's probably really sweet for them because it's someone that basically does all their work for them. Sure. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I worked for um, a history coach, he, like same thing I wanted to do, but he was a football coach. Gotcha. Um, could not care less about teaching history. That's how it works. Uh, <laughs> My history teacher was the, the same most, way. <laughs> yeah. Follow the most basic syllabus, Yep. you know, right by the book did, didn't deviate if mm -hmm. it was in the book, that was what the test was on and everything. So it was very easy, very boring. And mm -hmm. the students hated being there. There was no order or any, anything <laughs> to like interest. Yeah. It's, yep. You know, yep. people would walk out of class, people would do whatever they wanted. And I decided this isn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. Not the best. <laughs> so looking for things to do, I had worked at a museum in Lubbock. Oh, what? Uh, the Lubbock Lake. Yeah, the Lubbock Lake Landmark Museum, one of the few active uh, dig sites in America. Okay. So um, archaeological studies students will go and actually dig. They're still digging up, uh, not necessarily dinosaur bones, but 
um, like massive bison bones, what? mammoth bones. That's so cool. Yeah, it's it's this tiny little museum. Liked it, and I was like, maybe I'll get into museums. And then so um, went to history grad school for one semester. Perfect. That's all you need, really. <laughs> <laughs> Just dip the toe in. Hated it because uh, they're like, <laughs> they're like, well, you got to write a book. And I was like, I don't oh, want to write a book. I just yeah. want to like teach, but college students and, you mm-hmm. know, work in a museum and, and kind of get into that. Yeah. They're like, yeah, but uh, this is all about just basically becoming a professor in order to come right. become a professor. You have to write a book. Gotcha. And I didn't know what I wanted to write on. I went back and forth on like, you know, um, American uh thoughts on like soccer and why it's not as popular as other sports there we go hooliganism i went from that to french and native uh relations like during the french indian war yeah um a bunch of other just like random stuff and by the time i got finished i didn't like that either oh (laughs) so back to the drawing board (laughs) of course of course thinking of things to do finally decided that if I was going to do museums, the way to go is to go to library school. That's um, a thing? Yes. Really? And what is, become what an a, li- a librarian. So basically I get the, I get to help students mm-hmm. uh, with their research projects and learn a bunch of different things without having to write a book. And I get Perfect. to teach them and, and things like that. Um, so applied to Syracuse University. Oh, that's not close. No, New York. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> Uh, got in and they had a program where you go for a couple months, you take some basic classes, like the entry level librarian classes, mm-hmm. meet your professor, meet your fellow students, and then finish out your master's degree with like wherever you want. Mm-hmm. And so I went back to Texas, finished that up, uh, and had a master's in library and information sciences. Wow. Like a legit librarian. You're a master yep. librarian. Yeah. That's awesome. I make people call me Master Kennedy. As you should, uh, <laughs> as you should. You see Joe Costa new, you're like, she absolutely. <laughs> I feel like a Jedi. Um, That's awesome. So finished that up, could not find a job. I applied to Fair. what I felt like 300 different universities, small, big, um, couldn't get in anywhere. Had basically given up on that, was working at Banana Republic and my uncle who was uh, at uh, um, an agency company uh, for events was like, hey, I know some people at this other event company because you know we, I don't want to like basically do some nepotism type stuff, sure. but I'll get you an interview. <laughs> nice. At nice. this random company. Yeah, so drove up to Dallas, got an interview um, and started, this was back in 2011, started with okay. them basically filling out order forms for clients. Ah. So sure. all the stuff that the actual account managers didn't want to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I did. So okay. filled that out, worked there for three years. Finally, like worked my way up to actually getting clients like Hilton Hotels, wow. um, Qualcomm. So getting to go to like CES, sure. which was a great show, um, and Lucasfilm. And wow. then, yeah. And then worked with them for two years mm-hmm. and then left Freeman XP. Uh, the agency mm-hmm. and joined Lucasfilm. And then that's how we get to where I was that's in 2015. Yep. Wow. That's crit. You're a master librarian. That blows my mind. Yeah. Had no idea. Had no idea. So what kind of books do you own? I own a lot of actual, <laughs> well, I, I got rid of them just recently, but mm-hmm. I had a lot of like catalog, not catalog, because that sounds so lame. It's but, just uh, magazines. It's, all magazines <laughs> it's it's archival theory and and how to organize and start like a online database and things like that so it's okay. it's a lot of like how to um digitally archive some of your like physical things and put it online so i helped a lot of oh. part of part of my master's degree i helped a couple local museums and libraries digitize a lot of their collection that's cool so i have some stuff on that and then obviously i have a lot of fantasy books. Sure. Um, I actually have no Star Wars books. Legally. But I, yeah, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Hell um, yeah. Faerun, 
yes uh universe books that's kind of like my go-to i'm in i love dnd had you read every book that you owned definitely not yeah that's what i thought uh, that's what i thought it's impossible Take I, that. I, even librarians I, <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't read that much it's crazy sure um, it like if i had to pick pigeonhole myself in like a, the type of librarian it's archives and digital repositories and even like physical archives so it's sure. not necessarily about getting people to read and books and things like that it's mm -hmm. preservation right stuff right. so that's really what i'm was mostly interested in that's i got really to catalog cool. and archive my magic the gathering cards for one of my oh, projects really yeah that's awesome and then you had to say how you're storing it so you had to like store it in like a because this is Texas. So you had to describe that you're going to be kind of like keeping it in a temperature controlled room, which I didn't, but you just have to kind of like go through. The, you had the to process. know it was supposed to be in a temperature yeah, room. Right. <laughs> you had to basically do everything that you would do if, if, you, if you were actually archiving it, which it's a lot of fun. That's really cool. I'm like super into that because I had no idea. And I don't think I know anyone who's even like gone that far into that sort of a like profession. There really is. Neat one other person um that i've met just recently and that's madeline she's the archivist at yes Lucasville. i've crossed paths with her several times she seems super cool yeah that's awesome we, we always geeked out when we both were like you're a librarian i'm a librarian yeah <laughs> and we don't really do i mean hers is i would say more related to yeah. libraries mine com completely not sure sure did you have like a special pair of gloves you always wanted to use to like hold artifacts? If I had had the opportunity to touch anything like that, uh -huh. I definitely, you're a hundred percent supposed to wear gloves uh, mm -hmm. because that's just as part of the preservation, you know, your skin has all these oils and things like that, that can, mm -hmm. whether you whether you actually have like, che you know, Cheeto dust on your fingers or not, <laughs> sure, you, you still shouldn't be like touching anything you're trying to preserve. Right, right. That makes sense. I always think about like, if there was a, like a librarian that went out into the world. Have you ever seen Boondock Saints? The cartoon I am somewhat, or the movie. The no, movie with, of the with Willem Dafoe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of the same thing. <laughs> Um, you know, I've seen bits and pieces of it. I don't think I've actually ever seen the whole thing. It's pretty good. But Willem Dafoe's character has these latex gloves he keeps in like his back pocket and like a holder. And so I think that like every time a librarian is going to catalog something, they just pull them out. It's like, all right, I'm prepared for, for this. For sure. If I ever had to interact with anything at Lucasfilm that involved props or anything like that, I had to wear gloves. Yeah. I imagine after a while you want to get them monogrammed. So they're like serious, you know what I mean? It's like, these aren't regular gloves. These are librarian on the job gloves. I'm sure there are definitely people that have yeah. cooler gloves than just your normal run of the mill white ones. Yeah, that's why I couldn't be a librarian. Cause I'd be like, what day is it? How am I feeling? Just pull out a trench coat of gloves that are all different colors and things. I'd be the glove guy. That's how people can tell what kind of mood you're in. Exactly. Exactly. He's got the green gloves on. Just don't, don't look him in the eyes. <laughs> like a moonstone. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I also am a big fan of your art. It's really, really good. Now, Thank you. how, because what nobody gets that good as a <laughs> hobby. <laughs> like, um, did you want to get into art growing up? Like, when did this start? No. Well, I took art in high school. It was okay. dumb. Like you're making like yarn. <laughs> yeah. Of course, art and like other weird, you know, it's just stuff to keep you occupied for a couple of weeks. So it's right. Um, I enjoyed it. I developed, I developed my art, my love of art, actually at uh, my agency job because really, yeah. To circle back, um, mm -hmm. when I first started there, I'm filling out paperwork every day. Not every day somebody needs paperwork to fill out, so I would just sit there for. Sure. <laughs> hours <laughs> sure and um had some post-it notes for like uh notes that i was taking or like my to-do list or whatever mm -hmm. started drawing um actually let me let me pull this up on my phone i know people won't be able to see it but that's all right started for us <laughs> started drawing on post-it notes oh so that's actually how i got my start really 
Just with a pen? Yeah. Yep, just with a pen. Wow. I'll show you the very first drawing I have ever. Yeah. Did. And so, I actually crumpled it up, threw it in the trash. <laughs> as all story. artists do. Threw it in the trash, thought it was terrible. And my friend was like, actually, that's pretty good. Uh, oh, oh, almost my, there. Almost there. My background. Oh, 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 sweet. Yes. I think, is this on your Instagram? Yeah. Yeah, yep. it is. Yep. I've seen it. That's good. That's your um, first drawing you ever did? That was my first one. I, what? Why? Why? Are you, why? Your first drawing is supposed to be actually terrible. Like across <laughs> the board when we're like, mm -hmm, keep going, I guess. That's I, really I good. I think I have a pretty steady hand. Sure. And drawing I, um, what allowed me to be good at, I think, post-it note drawing is uh, mm -hmm. when you stare at your phone, it's the same size as, uh, you know, like I would find sure. images that were basically like phone sized. Sure. And so I would just do one to one replicas mm -hmm. of what sure. I see. So th that's really what I've developed to be. I can, I need reference. Um, sure. I would love to be like the artist that can, you know, like, okay, you want this guy, he's flexing and or throwing a spear or something like that. I can't wrap my head like that. That sure. form of art is mind blowing. But if there's like a cool photo or something like that, um, and you want it stylized and hand drawn or uh, love to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it comes through because it's really good. I know some of the like, um, I think there are the Vanity Fair pictures that you would just yeah. reimagine. It's like, how do you make it better? I don't know how you did it, but it looks really cool. I I can't do any of that. Like any sort of art is just magic to me. So anytime I see it and it's good, I'm like, what is this? They're all, yeah. And they're all pretty unique because I don't do it the same way every single time. I kind of make it up as I go. Sure. Um, there's some post programs. I'll run the art through. And a lot of the stuff is like some, you know, uh, somebody could ask me, how did I do it? And I really don't know how I did yeah. it. I did it in the moment. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and yeah, that's it, how it turned out. That's wild. And is it is it something that you have to like, did it come naturally to you? Or did you have to work on it really hard? Or uh, Definitely practice. Yeah. Um, you know, the the post-it note art was just a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. And then when I switched to digital, that was really rough at the uh, the time I had, I bought like a Wacom tablet, mm -hmm. tried that for a while. It was really weird because you would draw on the pad right? and then, yeah, it would be up on the screen. Oof. So you, I have to look down at what I'm drawing pretty much at all times. Right. Right. And so you, you had to get used to like looking up and it was very strange. Yeah, I eventually tossed that when I found out that iPads, this is a long time ago, but at Procreate um, ah. came about and that basically changed my life as sure. far as art was concerned. Um, right. That's all I use. You can export to um, Photoshop, even though I, I wish I was better at Photoshop. I'm not very good, uh, mm -hmm. but Procreate, I use that pretty much with everything that I do. That's cool. So Procreate, like digital art is now like your thing? Or are you still experimenting with other mediums? Uh, you know, Digital is my way to go uh, mm -hmm. because of what my job entailed as far as like travel and things like that. I can just ah, sure. bring my Apple pen and my, my iPad and I'm good to go. Right, right. There's no cleanup. I don't have to smart, it's cheaper. Know, wait for good lighting. I can, as you said, like I can lay in bed at night if I can't sleep mm -hmm. and, and do some art or I'll just like put on my headphones and listen to music and paint for a couple hours. It's it's more therapeutic and um, that's cool. A tool to as a stress reliever than it is anything that I hope to make money off of. Sure. Although I ha I have made money off of it. Um, Good doing dog portraits mostly. But hey, they like in the uniforms or just like dogs. <laughs> just um, I, I I've been asked to do some cat um, portraits, and okay. I'm gonna put them in like the old style. You know, like that's a the theme. Oh, yeah. like dressing your your uh, as Elizabethan style yep. animals or whatever. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, so give them like the, the frill neck. Yeah, that's um, what I'm talking about. I'd, yeah, like a, so. I'd like to see a picture of Miles in like an admirable uniform, you know? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, that wouldn't be hard at all. You know, you can figure it out. There's a market for it. I'll, I'll, I'll send you pictures of Kubo and we'll figure something out. Yeah. We'll make, it, we'll make it happen. It's all done by word of mouth at this point. I don't like yeah. solicit. 
it's someone's like, oh my, for, I did one for a couple of people at Christmas. I did one for um, like as a housewarming gift. Um, I find that if I'm supposed to do something for somebody else, it takes me a lot longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's usually how it works. It, is it, is it still therapeutic if you're making it for somebody else? No, not at yeah. all. That's why I would never yeah, want to fair. do it for money because Smart. as soon as it becomes a job, it, it's just so tedious and yeah. There's I, stakes. I mean, yeah, I, th mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think the biggest artists can get away with like, they're like, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Someone's going to buy it. Yep. Yep. And that's an amazing place to be at. Cause you're just like, I don't, nobody totally. cares exactly what I do. I won't do commissions. I will just paint whatever I want to paint and someone mm -hmm. will buy it. And yep. that's a good place to be at, but, um, I'm not there. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> few people are few people are. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that money ruins art more often than not. It's like once money gets involved, there's a pressure and then there's there's stakes involved. And it's like, if you can just come at it from just art, you can actually get more out of it from the artists, I find. Yeah. 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 People always ask if I sell, sell my paintings. A, they're not my IP and I get a little, Good point. you know, working for Star Wars, I get a little um, hesitant to do something like that. Not that sure. I would ever end up on their list for anything. It's just, right. <laughs> sure. It would be kind of a bad look in, in my opinion to like have right. more form and then make money off the IP on the side. So it's a good point. It's a good point. It's valid. It's valid. So when you're, it's funny to hear that like history classes in Texas are the same as they are in Florida because, uh, same sort of thing, except what we would do is we would get our teacher going off on like a rant and then he would just rant the entire class and we wouldn't learn anything. And then we would just leave and we would do this every day. So That's amazing. like almost everyone failed it or a friend and I, knew how to set the teacher off and just go off. And the kids that actually were there to learn and get good grades were not a fan of us because they're trying to learn and we're taking the teacher off on tangents. It's a, uh, I guess high school is high school. Yeah. I, d I don't think it's gotten any better since no, we've been there. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> what, what kind of history were you into? Uh, French history, even though I didn't speak French. Okay. I take in Spanish. So it's not like I planned any of this out. Um, right. <laughs> sure. Um, and early colonial American history is like kind of my, nice. um, it, yeah. Assassin's Creed three, like that oh, yeah. game for me was That's amazing because that time period, <laughs> sure. Almost like Hamilton time. Right. It, right. Is some of my favorite. What, what is it about that time period that gets you into it? I think people were just still, discovering um america and like yeah navigating like society um, yeah society yeah and they were trying to build something new um and deal with you know all the things that that come with that and um there was so much unknown and so i think that really kind of catered a lot of creative people uh, catered to a lot of creative people and allowed them to you sure. know, all these amazing discoveries and things like that. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that that's a couple of reasons. And I just thought it was cool. Um, yeah. War back then was like classic, you know, like two lines of people just kind of yeah. going at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> War back then was rolling the dice. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that cannonball is coming and you're, yeah. you just hope to God you're not in its line. Yeah. So, um, that whole thing was probably why. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have like a favorite historical figure that you like did a lot of reports on and Do were super into? Have... Mm, all right. Wasn't I expecting really... that one, were you? <laughs> no, I was not. And I don't really think I do. Yeah. Um, there's a couple French kings, you know, like mm, Louis the was a 14th, you know, 14th through 16th, kind of that whole time period over in France is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, Robespierre and like the French Revolution type stuff uh -huh. um, is mm -hmm. kind of cool to me. Um, the Jacobins and all that stuff. There you <laughs> like, go. Yeah, I'm like trying to recall some of these like right. buzzwords from that time. <laughs> Let's really um, test that memory. <laughs> French history is pretty cool. The French Revolution is really awesome. The way that um, they rose up and went against the king and overthrew mm -hmm. them and basically like started restarted their own government. 
Yeah. And then it ultimately failed because the people at the top became too greedy and then they overthrew them and then I yep. had to like do a complete <laughs> reset. So that whole thing, I took a history class in college and we got to just, uh, it was this like role playing way of learning. And so we each took up a different part of the French Revolution. Oh, cool. And we each had objectives and agendas. And it was basically, uh, basically uh, we would meet every day and try to convince some other portion of uh, the French Revolution to join our side or. Uh, oh, that's cool. So it was kind of like a live debate. And there was certain things you would try to get out of other groups. Um, but it was all like there was no right or wrong way to do it. Oh, that's cool. So we just ended up with the government that we ended up with. And I think we did like a triumph, like um, I pitched uh, a government where you have like three, it's almost like Minority Report. Um, oh. Have you seen that movie? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. With the yeah. three like uh, yeah. psychic people. So that are they, the they can't see each other. They're in three separate rooms. They can't see each other. Smart. And they govern uh, without really any outside knowledge of like how society is. So it's completely okay objective so, and sure. they make decisions without knowing how the other person is going to decide. It like would never work in real life and right, those yeah. people would live <laughs> terrible, horrible lives. But yeah. <laughs> in theory, it, in could, theory. it could create, uh, you know, because two can out, outweigh the one. If right. it's all three, it's all unanimous. Sure. Um, and so they make these decisions on how to govern it's just not realistic because they would make decisions that aren't necessarily good for some, you know, some people because they don't have the context. Yep. Um, yeah. So, so I think ultimately it would fail, but in the class, it was cool. Yeah. When people bought into it. <laughs> there you go. And Hey, the French government stuff failed anyway. So it would fit right in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's a quick. Government's turnaround. a sham anyways. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm with you. Also, it's crazy to me that like a lot of the stuff came later on in life. So the fact that you like got into events after becoming a master librarian and then got into art because you were hanging out in an agency trying to pass time. Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I started like- in events when I was, well, I went to, I got, I got a master's by the time I was 23. I went what? straight, I went straight from dude undergrad minus that extra semester of history grad school, but I graduated uh-huh. in two years. So I was, I, uh, yeah, I was, well, I was 20, I was just turning 24 when I graduated. Wow. With a and master's. then so got into events by the time I was 25. So, uh, dude, I wish I'd got into events sooner because I love them. Yeah. But you know, hindsight 2020, right? I, I can't, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. Sure. It, is there a, like when you're doing events, like what type of events did you do? Was it always like conventions and things like that? Or was it like weddings and things? Never weddings, always okay. probably best um, corporate events. So that's whether it's just a seminar that okay. the company is putting on mm-hmm. or an activation or a trade show booth, like even a 10 by 10. I, gotcha. did, I worked on a, they start you off at like the most basic level. So you're just doing, I did like 113 shows a year for the you know oh. first couple of years. Yeah, so we're talking like one every three days. Good God! Um, but they were just little 10 by 10s, and I was just like sending little pop ups around the country for all these various companies. Wow! Um, and then you start working your way up, and you get you know like a 20 by 20, and you're super excited about it because then you're actually working with some real estate. Yeah. And then work your way up. Um, Qualcomm was like a hundred by. 120 it was two stories um they would have a meeting rooms in the second stories and it would take uh, my my partner who was higher up than me so he had the the main account with qualcomm and mm-hmm. i assisted him with it so cs is in january um mm-hmm. most years um and he would start installing the booth the day after thanksgiving in vegas so he wow. would eat yeah, we'd have Thanksgiving dinner with his family. And that week they would basically take the next two weeks to start constructing this $3 million booth. Oh, they would take uh, two weeks off for Christmas. So they would fly back home for, and then come back basically the day after Christmas and then start back up again. And we would have two weeks to get it all completed um, wow. in time for the show. Sheesh. Now, did you go by like, 
were you handling like the venue and everything inside of it or were your section inside of the venue? Just our section. So just wow. our little booth space. Uh-huh. Um, but they had massive, they did all their business there. So they would meet with people from all over the world every day. Gotcha. Um, their booth had something like eight conference rooms, like full size conference rooms oh. within the booth. Yeah. Ah. So that's why it was two stories. So the yeah. bottom story was like, walkways and things like that and you go up these stairs and they would have these little breakout rooms to probably fit like eight people to a room so i did all the catering orders um, wow for the entire week for them and then just like little um construction projects around the booth like they brought in a car and wow uh, the, the car could be charged by um a wireless pad it was an electric car it could be charged by almost like you know like a cell phone in the way oh, that you okay. just set it down on the pad but this was a car um, wow. And then they, they partnered with Dolby around the time that Star Trek was um, the, the reboot, the JJ reboot. Uh huh. It's like, oh, no. And they, they built an entire Dolby theater that could seat something like what? 40 people <laughs> what? and and, ha- and was Dolby certified. So, in order to do that, it's a, a lot of rigorous testing. So, the speakers have to be like in very specific places. Um, yeah. The audio, they bring like a, a reader in, and the audio quality has to be like to a certain standard and they mm-hmm. would run these people through basically the star trek trailer in dolby wow. surround sound and it blew people away but that was just in the corner of the booth so not what? even the main booth that's wild yeah man How, what is the average like uh like research time before an event like that you put into a booth like how much time do you have to think about how you're going to mm-hmm. lay everything out as an event person, you you yeah. would prefer sixty days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Six, okay. Like not, uh, sixty to ninety days is very good lead time. Okay. Um, but especially at a, sh- a show like CS, like they have order deadlines. So mm. um, how how a show works, like Celebration, for instance. Sure. Um, Read Pop and Lucasfilm are the overall um, organizer of the show. Mm-hmm. They partner with the company like Freeman. So the company that I used to work for also did general contracting. Oh, okay. So they provide all the labor, um, mm-hmm. like the forklifts, the people that help build booths. Sure. Um, furniture, um, you know, like audio visual in most cases. Sure. So if you need a TV or something like that, like they would help you with that. Cool. And in order to facilitate that, they have um, basically like pricing deadlines. So like oh. 40, 45 days out, uh, you get a 30% discount. Mm-hmm. Um, 30 days out, you get 15% discount. Oh. And then you pay full price. And then eventually, like if you're five days before the show and you're like, I need a 60 inch TV, they're like, okay, well, that's like a premium price kind of thing. Sure. So as um like a client side working for that. Like you try to hit these deadlines to try, you want your booth to be as cheap as possible, obviously. Right. Um, so 60 to 90 days, you want to, you want those 90 days because uh, like if we were designing our San Diego comic-con booth, it mm-hmm. would take us about 30 days to really nail a design. Really? That's cool. um, and, and that's getting all the stakeholders involved. So um, oh, yeah. it, when, when we designed a booth for San Diego comic-con, it went all the way up to Kathy. Really? Uh, yeah, wow. because um, the activations that we would do were part of the marketing tie-ins for most of the movies because oh, sure. like, let's just say in 2017, we were preparing for The Last Jedi. So mm-hmm. the trailer, I think, had already dropped, but we you know, had like Kai Thernali and um, 3PO and a couple other, you know, as part of our like displays. Sure. Um, I think Kai Thernali was that. That's the actual costume. Oh, cool. Um, from the movie. So yeah. Um, we we have these concepts. We get the graphics, so we make the booth kind of look like a ship, um, from the movie and things like that. And then, so in order to get everybody to buy it, it's got to go all the way up. And sure, they, they have to make sure that we're not overstepping or showing something we shouldn't show. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. Does like uh, when you're designing these booths and stuff like that, what's the average, like how many versions does it go through before you decide this is what it's going to be? I think, well, 
it's a it's a chicken or the egg type situation because ah, sure we would always go in and design the most amazing booth. Um, <laughs> Of course, of course. It's your uh, job. You know, when we did like the Rogue One booth, we it was like tiered to kind of look like Yavin. Oh, cool. I don't know if, if you ever saw pictures of it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so so we were gonna have tons of tiers and gonna have like moss hanging out or whatever. And you're mm-hmm. like, great. And that goes all the way to the top. They're like, that looks amazing. And then you go to the company that's helping you build the booth, and they're like, Okay, cool. That's gonna cost three million dollars. <laughs> and you're like, okay. Oh, <laughs> so you well, get the breakdown of the booth and you're like okay don't need okay maybe we don't need the moss maybe we don't right. need the third <laughs> tier you know like how can we it's a balance right so yeah. you want it to look like yavin without maybe replicating like every level of yavin or something like that right um, it's the cake topper version yeah I hear so you. you you go back and forth on that until you get it in, in within your budget and that can take you know, three or four goes. And what, what part of that pipeline are you in? Uh, from the very beginning. Wow. So me and my boss, um, you know, when we had a Comic-Con, we would be, we would, he, I wouldn't always get to go with him because he was the event manager and I was the event coordinator, but mm-hmm. um, sometimes we would get to go look at uh, BTS shots, BTS ships. Um, cool. Like stuff, early stuff. Um, mm-hmm. obviously no story points, but it was just like sure. characters. Um, so I had no like frame of reference of like, who's, who, who's what or what they would say, like good, bad, basically. I, sure. Um, and we would be like, oh, that looks cool. Or this, you know, this character looks cool. And we would request them from our physical assets team. If it was a character or, um, we would ask basically permission for it from a graphic standpoint to be like, okay, well, can we do this theme? And we would get oh, the, okay. the go ahead. And then that's when we would start to kind of like create um, the structure and the theme of the booth. And sure. then we would kind of go back and forth and figure that out. And then, you know, before you know it, we would start in January more or less. And then by, I mean, so we did it way out, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, by, may we would have everything locked in and and get ready for june and get everything that we needed to have shipped there prepped and everything like that Mm -hmm. man that sounds like so much work (laughs) (laughs) i mean um while i was at lucasfilm my two main jobs were san diego comic-con and celebration really that kept me busy the entire year and then of course we would fill in for premieres and press junkets and um, you know, eventually we started operating BB-8. So mm-hmm. I would go to like ESPN for a BB-8 appearance or cool. shoot a commercial in LA for like Nissan. Right. Um, right. And, and cool. so between that, you were just traveling or like Chewbacca was going to be a presenter at the Nickelodeon's Kid Choice Awards. So you would, mm-hmm. you know, have to go and bring the suit down to LA or wherever he needed to go and, and the right. performer and bring him and stuff and get him ready. Right on, right on. Looking back on like all the years that you've been a coordinator, is there any event or booth that you're like really, really proud of? You're like, this took forever or it was really ambitious and it just sticks in your mind? The, the Rogue One was pretty cool because um, that was the year after I had joined, I believe it was 2016. Mm-hmm. And, and when I got to Lucasfilm, from the agency side um, and seeing the booth that I had worked on, it was such a mishmash of, you know, you, you've, you've been there, right? So it's just like, yeah. um, it's just like a bunch of different um, companies, you know, that licensees, there we go. That's what I was right. Licensees that have paid money to use the star Wars brand and they each have their own little spot mm-hmm. and they're basically just selling their wares and, yep. Prior to me getting there, it was like everybody kind of brought in their own graphics, did their own thing. So it looked like an actual Star Wars market, but it drove me insane because (laughs) you'd have somebody with, you know, bright blue and then somebody would just have like green or black or sure. And and their structure was like wiry. And then the other people's was like construction paper. Yeah, it wasn't construction (laughs) paper, but there's no 
cohesiveness. <laughs> right. And so um, that Rogue One booth that we did, I really pushed um, to my boss and be like, hey, we should come up with a theme and then make everybody use the same graphics and just kind of look like it's all very coordinated. Yeah. And that was the first year that we did it. And it was a, a really pain in the butt for our, um, a lot of our licensees. It was, it was really difficult to get them to get on board because sure. <laughs> there was, there was cost add-ons. They were like, okay, well you have to use our graphics and you have to use this kind of material and do mm -hmm. these kinds of things where normally they would just like leave it looking wiry and sure. That's yeah, Star Wars and I will figure it out. <laughs> right. They're like, we're just selling stuff. Why do we care what our booth looks like? Right. You're like, because I'm Daniel um, Kennedy. All right. <laughs> new, new sheriff in town. Figure this out. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and so we started that year and then, as years progressed, it became easier and easier. And by the time I left, I mean, that's what they would always reach out and be like, what's the theme for this year? And oh, cool. what's the graphics and things like that. So um, it's kind of a little legacy I left on San Diego Comic-Con. And, and that go. booth, that first year, was the one I'm super proud about. Good. You should be. That's And also, that's like jumping into the deep end as well. Your first year, and it's like, all right, the first spinoff Star Wars movie booth figure it out you got this and hey you did a pretty good job <laughs> not bad yeah not bad. I'll, I, I'll give it to you <laughs> and then obviously celebration is um quite the undertaking yeah yeah is that is there a core is there a correlation between like all cons and celebration because from the from the attendee side celebration just feels different than anything else like maybe because it's just star wars but the way it's curated feels very specific but i don't know what that is it is, I would say it's the closest to, to um, a pop culture con. And now those, those have become, I, I feel like pop culture cons have really, um, prior to COVID, obviously, um, has taken everything down a notch. But yeah, prior to that, I feel like out of nowhere, everything was popping up um, as a, a pop culture con. Uh, so, yeah. you know, Emerald City Comic Con became uh, out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, like a thing and New York comic-con oh, was yeah. never that big. You know, oh. if you look back like 10 years ago and now it's, it's the most trafficked um, yeah. con in North America. That's so wild. So, so I think, I think celebration marvels. It, um, it tries to be like a San Diego comic-con, but it does have that, um, it feels more genuine because everything is so focused. Sure. Because uh, we, you know, while I was there, organize, you know, the merchandise was very tongue in cheek and like fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the panels were the best. Yeah, exactly. Like very, you know, we had a whole stage that was completely fan driven. Yeah. Um, we had a podcast stage like so it mm -hmm. took the best elements of a lot of different cons and i think combined them and then of course when it, when it's centered around star wars like how can you lose as long as you like listen to the fans and and um uh kind of give them what they want i mean when we would how a lot of celebration came about was just we would have a meeting and bring in uh, various people from Lucasfilm and we would just sit and be like, what do we want? What would we want to um, go to as far as panels? Sure. Go? Yeah. And we would just be like, well, let's do a panel on this. Uh, um, a lot of people had the insight of like knowing like um, what things were coming down the pipeline and stuff like that. So obviously mm -hmm. like the bigger departments games, you know, sure. Of course they're going to have like a fallen order panel. Um, right. And, um, but some of the funner things like the, exactly the creature panel yeah um, i think in london and a couple other ones that was the first one that they had ever really done like that that's so cool and because they were so close to pinewood it just made complete sense that we would just truck everything over sure um and and they did an amazing job yeah so actually speaking of celebration merch somebody might have designed their own piece in the form of an ahsoka tano jersey Dude. I <laughs> what? What? Yeah, I had I had no idea that that was going to be as big as it was. How um, cool! People are wearing your shirt. Yeah. What? Uh, I get. By the way, I get no money from that. I sure. Get absolutely of course. nothing. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, that came about. Uh, I had 
art displayed on my desk and um, Ahsoka Tana herself um, was basically in the office that day mm -hmm. um, and she was meeting with just a bunch of different people, you know, like about her universe stuff. Mm -hmm. um, this is Ashley Eckstein, by the way. It, yes, case... of course. The queen. <laughs> the queen. Yes. In case one of your listeners was like, okay, which one? But, yeah, right. um... The cartoon was in your office. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she was like, oh, I love, she, I think she followed me on Instagram. I don't know if she still does because she doesn't really run the Her Universe account anymore. It's, it's, right mostly the brand at this point. Right. Um, she's like, Oh, I love your art. We should do something. And I was like, okay. And she was like, yeah, uh, we're doing a big Ahsoka Tano theme for Chicago um, mm -hmm. because it's, I think one of the anniversaries of Clone Wars or Clone Wars is coming back. I think at that point, or they were dropping a trailer. I can't remember. Right. The I think they were dropping a trailer. Yeah. It was um, a season seven trailer. Yeah. Thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, so she was like, I'm, I'm, basically doing an all Ahsoka Tana line. I want you to do something. And I was like, okay. Dude. Um, yeah. I had been obsessed with like eighties track suits. Perfect. Um, Why not? I wore them all the time in high school and I was like, this is a cool trend. I think, I think this would look good if I yeah. did a design around it. Um, and so just did a quick mock-up of it and sent it along. And she's like, that's exactly what I was thinking in my head. And they, they tweaked it, I think, a little bit. They gave it, like, the blue neckline, I think. But other than that, that's, like, all um, wow. what I did on my iPad. They gave me a little template. So it's just, like, a, um, a white picture of a shirt, basically a sweater. Mm -hmm. It's got the outline in black. And then right. you just fill it in. Wow. So I just painted it out, Batano in the middle. Yeah. And sent it back to them. And they're like, yep, that's what we want. Dude, there's a, there's and a Funko with your shirt. <laughs> there's a like a Mickey or like um yeah you can yeah. those like little what? dolls that you can build like the Disney version of Build a Bear. Yeah, there's tiny versions of a shirt you designed. It's pretty cool. And I've retired, so yeah. I will <laughs> <Yeah>. never... <laughs> well, you peaked. That's what happened. Yeah, I peaked way <laughs> quicker than I had ever imagined. That's right. There are like designers that work their whole life to get toys wearing their clothes and you nailed it it's a cool design i uh i don't think i have mine anymore i i don't know if i lost it or something oh no but um yeah we'll i don't put, actually think i even own it we'll put the call out if anyone hears this and has it <laughs> <laughs> they're still selling it i still see like it's back in stock oh really I mean, this is like two years later wow and it's still one of their best sellers dude was there, not, were to toot, there, not to toot my own horn, but I'll I'll toot your horn. Listen, <laughs> what were there multiple versions that you went through to get to that, or it was just inspired? Nope, that wow. was one and only. Pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not a bad. I, I might have the, the file somewhere, um, and I did. What's funny is after that, I did a bunch of other designs, sent it to them, and they never went for it. <laughs> so I swear, I did like. Finn, a version of Finn. Yeah. Because um, I was like, oh, maybe they'll do like a cool line of these. Sure. Why not? I did a Kylo version that had like um, the top portion, you know, because it's all sectioned off. So you have right. the middle portion. It would say Kylo. Cool. Um, and it was like black, white, black. And then I had red. The top portion was like the red cracks in his helmet. Ooh, that's cool. And then it had almost like an Adidas stripe, but it was four silver lines going down the sleeve like his oh, helmet. like that yeah oh that's cool that's yeah cool. i would yep. have loved for that to get made but um unfortunately it's it's not gonna happen but i thought at least if they could go for one more design the kai well of course you know i love kylo yeah so that, that, that was do. the one design i spent a lot of time on that one and i was like this design's pretty good yeah <laughs> how, how many pieces of kylo merchandise did your collection have Cause it got, it got very impressive. I've seen pictures. Oh man. Um, I, it must've been, I mean, it took over my entire desk by the end yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. And actually by the time I left, I gave a lot of it away because I was just like, I'm not gonna, um, if I don't have a desk 
or like I don't have the space to keep all this stuff. Right, right. Um, I don't even know if I have a photo of it. <gasps> a librarian who doesn't have an archive of his collection. What's happening? No, I did. I did that would have taken me years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had like bags of chips. I had <laughs> um, like pe a Pez dispenser, a Kylo Pez dispenser. It's amazing. Um, I still have a skateboard. Oh, perfect. That's actually probably my prized possession is. Um, um, it must have been 2015. Mm -hmm. No, 2017. Uh, Santa Cruz was one of our licensees and they did hmm. a bunch of limited edition um, skate decks. Oh, sweet. And I have one of 150. Uh, it's, Dude. It's like, maybe I can, I'll go grab it real quick. Yeah, let me see it. Wow. So, yeah, signed by the artist, 94 of 100. Oh, there's even less. There's wow. only 100. There's 100. And that finish just, is crazy. Yeah. Um, with obviously him hand drawn in the back. Yeah, that is beautiful. So that survived. Well done. I'm glad. I'm glad to know that the DK Kylo collection survives. There's I have a small left. bag. I was basically limited to like 10 or 12 items out of my collection. Yep. Of, it must have been like 200 different things. <laughs> um, and yeah, I managed to keep some of those, but not obviously not all of them. That's how moving works. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it, well, they're still in my closet. So I, ha I haven't even, I don't have a way to really display them. Yeah. Yeah, went through the same thing when I moved. I, it's also funny what things you keep, like bags of chips and like that'll work. Like I, I went to actually after I saw you, I got to go to the ranch, and I got to watch mm. a movie there in the theater, and it was this really cool experience. Got to tour there, and I got to go to the store, and so I still have the bag of the things oh, yeah. that I bought from Skywalker. It's like I need this. I just have it's it's a Skywalker Ranch bag, you know. I gotta have it. And I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> What, did you watch like their weekly reel or did so you actually watch? I got, I got to see two things. I got to see one that was uh, a reel of like the different layers of sound on the movies. And at that time it was like a bunch of like Creed oh, wow. two, which was really cool. And like, cause my friend worked there and he was like, Oh, I'm going to show you and talk to the projectionist. And it was him, my wife and I. So we got to sit in the theater and it was like oh. a, it was like a five minute video and it showed all the different movies. And then it would show all the work they did in the scenes. So he played like a scene from Creed 2 and it was like just the soft hits and then just the hard hits and then add the music and then add the crowds and then add the breathing. And it like, it was really cool. Wow. So, so I got to see that. And then they did a screening of Ad Astra the day before it came out. And so we got to go back again and go watch that in the theater with the people. And it was cool. That theater is cool. very nice. It's, mm -hmm. it's ruined theaters for me now. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you oh, get right. to sit in that? Um, they have it at actual um, the main Lucasfilm campus, but it's a seat in the theater and it's got a little laser that shoots down onto it. What? And it's in the very middle of the theater and that's supposed to be the perfect spot. Really? That's the one that uh, George would sit in when he was like reviewing what? Uh, clips and things because the sound is basically calibrated for that specific seat. That makes sense. When I worked at the so, movie theater, I used, to, I used to do that. Go to the middle seat of the middle row. Yep. It just felt right. That's crazy. But there was a little laser pointer to just like show, really? show you exactly where it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's so you cool. You go back. Yeah. Noted. Noted. The laser seat. That's pretty cool. And we, we have another thing in common in the past year. We both adopted a fur child. Yeah. How's it going? How's it going with you? Um, <laughs> Miles is super chill. Yeah. What's that like? <laughs> it's great. Was he, he always? To to... No. Um, okay. He had to... Uh, Frenchies apparently have like very small intestines or something like that. Sure. So he poops a lot. Really? Okay. We're talking like five or six times a day, seven times, wow. maybe sometimes. He's gotten better at holding it. Sure. Um, I think today I've taken him out three times. Nice. Uh, and I'll probably take him out again before we go to bed. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that dog uses the bathroom a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's the chill. At least you get the chill side of it. You know? Yeah, he's super low key. He'll cuddle and lay and sleep. like when we get up in the morning, sometimes he won't even get up. He's like, I'm not ready to get up. Really? It's, yeah, he'll sleep till he can sleep till like nine or 10. That's amazing. He is very cute. You guys, you guys picked a good one. I'm a proud papa. For yeah, sure. Uh, same, same. I walk around I'm like, this is my son, Kubo. 
you can see where he gets his looks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm one of the, I'm just shy of putting clothes on him. <laughs> oh, I put clothes on Miles all the time. Yeah. <laughs> loves am- it. Amazing. He loves it. If you start him early enough, he just doesn't, he's like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Right. <laughs> I'm fine with it. Kubo gets like, he gets the zoomies, which is just like an insane mm-hmm. amount of energy. Just cause no, like nothing sent him off. He just randomly is like, we're running for our lives now. And uh, yeah, he's a lot. Miles gets that every now and then. He gets mm-hmm. it usually after like a bath or something. That's also oh yeah, like, like when they get that like post bath where they have to like run around. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I I operate Miles's Instagram, and I, I think Kubo, <laughs> he he has one as well, right? He should. Did I make I, that up. I oh. have not made one, but now I really want to. It's a good oh, idea. You should. <laughs> um, and he, yeah, we have like. Uh, there that's he, him oh in a mask. My God. How he did wore a little you... face mask, and he like wore it. I mean, he he wore it long enough for the photo. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> he uh, but but overall, he, he, if you just start him at an early age and you start just putting things on them, sure, sure. They get. He doesn't necessarily like like the face mask. He didn't necessarily like, but it that's didn't, fair. Like really bother him too much, but um. I think he ripped it off like right after that. Yeah. But <laughs> it was long enough for to get him to sit and pose for it. Wow. And it was like, okay, I'm done with it. That's pretty good. But he loves to wear sweaters and stuff too. Oh, no, really? Yeah. And, and he just doesn't fight you on it. That's amazing. No. The the closest we have to that is when Kubo like gets his nails trimmed and stuff. He just lets you do it because we always played with his feet. So he was used to having his feet touched where other dogs you don't. And then they freak out when you got to cut their nails. But that's exactly it. I am so scared to trim Miles's nails. We we take him to the vet. We're like, okay, (laughs) we're going to let professionals do this. (laughs) I have a nail trimmer and it's got like a little guard. So it like almost prevents you from going too far, Mm -hmm. but it still freaks me out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't trust myself. And Kubo's just crazy. He's, he's wild. He's wild, but he's good. He's also a really good traveler. We've taken him to Washington. He's been really? to Philly, New York, Boston. Dude. And his, his one year birthday is in a week. When, when was he He'll born? 21. He was born um, April 23rd, 2020. That's fun. Kubo was born May 2nd, 2020. Oh, wow. They're yes. pretty close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got like a week on him. Not bad. Not bad. How much does he weigh? He weighs 30 pounds. Kubo's 26. Um, so he's a little stout for a Frenchie. Mm-hmm. The own the people we got him from was like, oh, he'll be like 20 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> and then he just kept getting bigger and bigger. And we we're like, uh-oh. But yeah. he does fit in a little carrier and it's not nice. like the most comfortable for him, but you can put him under the seat long enough to like for takeoff. Sure. And then we usually like pull him out a little bit and like open the top so he can hit, but he'll lay there for you know wow. like ten, when we flew to philly um for like christmas um luckily that you know the the planes like we had the whole row to ourselves so that helps but mm-hmm. um we took a red eye so we were like okay we'll just Oof. get there get there at 10 and it'll be like he'll he's going to bed right because it was his that was his very first flight wow and it's a six hour flight i think from la to philly Mm-hmm. as we were landing in philly i guess there was too much fog and so we literally touched wheels and then just took right back off oh no yeah went to new york um oh because landed in new york w- was not allowed to get out the plane but they fueled us up we had to wait about two hours so he's still what chilling and then we fly back to philly and then land and he somehow survived the whole flight without you know <laughs> using the bathroom or anything and as soon as we got off we like rushed him to the dog area sure but i was so impressed yeah that's no- human children don't do that well <laughs> <laughs> he um he's pretty quiet he'll bark at like um a knock at the door yeah yeah but that's really about it oh Kubo barks at nothing. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there and they want to kill us. Hold on. I'll be right back. He's, he's crazy. 
He's a crazy. Do you boy. appreciate the barking as a warning, or do you, do you would you rather him? You know, we go back and forth because there are days like he's really smart. That's another problem because like he knows, and like when he needs to go outside, he'll come over and he'll like hit you or he'll like bark at you, and you're like, all right, what what do you need? Is like, are you hungry or is it the bathroom? And then he'll just look at you really weird, and then he does this thing where he's like, I call it picking fights, where he just looks at you and goes like, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's we can do it. I'm like, okay, okay, we'll go outside. It's just a funny little tell, but we take him out like five times a day just because he likes to be outside. Yeah, yeah. I try I try to get him to the dog park every now and then. Yeah. Um, but Frenchies, you can't like if it's over a certain temperature, they because their you know noses are so so short mm-hmm. and they have a lot of respiratory problems. Like you same. can't you can't um exercise all that much. Yep, yep. Bugs are the same way. They're brachiocephalic because they're, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. We live on the third floor. So we take the elevator down and take the stairs up. And that's how yeah. he maintains his weight. He's a thick that's boy. Exactly what I do too. We're oh, on really? The second floor. Yeah. That's take funny. the elevator down and I'll usually take the stairs back up to try to yeah. get him like some bonus exercise. Boom. We did it. Look at that. <laughs> that's funny. Okay. Liverpool, you're an American that loves soccer. Explain this to me because I have a friend. My oldest friend is obsessed with Manchester United. Like that's his team. So when when I meet, when I meet someone else, like Kyle Newman is another big football Mm -hmm. fan. And then then yourself, I'm like, okay, it it fascinates me because I love soccer because I played it growing up, but I don't have like a team. So when I meet someone who has a sports team, but it's soccer, I'm immediately interested. Yeah, I grew up playing soccer. My um, like any younger brother, whatever their older brother does. So I have an older brother. Um, oh, cool, cool. Whatever they do, you just copy it. Um, of course, of course. So he, he played soccer. So I just wanted to play soccer. Nice. Um, what and position? I played from the. T- uh, well, I was three when I started, and I played until m- more or less I was like in co- um, in college. I played like. Wow. I didn't play for Texas Tech. Doesn't have a soccer yeah, but team, still. but. Um, to maintain it is commendable. Yeah. And um, I had a bunch of injuries and a bunch of knee surgeries and stuff like that. So I had Comes to with it. Qu- quit. Yeah. I had six knee surgeries, which. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in college, wanted to um, NBC had signed that new deal with uh-huh. the EPL. Right. And so I was thinking about what team I wanted to root for. Cause I wanted to have a, like a somewhat genuine reason to like root for a team. I knew that wasn't going to be Manchester United because they suck. Um, <laughs> right. They're actually very good, but um, I hate... but not to a Liverpool fan. They aren't right. And so looked back at my history. I grew up, um, I'd gone to London cause my brother's team was very good. And they played in in a tournament in in London, and so oh, cool. I bought a couple of kits. I had a Tottenham kit. Um, it was like bright yellow, and I wore it. My 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 parents took a bunch of photos on the trip and like afterwards, and I wore it almost every day. Nice. So I had a little connection to Tottenham. Um, Arsenal was like one of my other big ones, and like um, one of their players, Thomas Rosicki, at the time, he's not he's like long retired now but I, I loved watching him play mm-hmm. um so i kind of was into arsenal and then thinking about it um we had had a liverpool like youth development team come through texas when i was a oh. kid and um we housed two of their players for i think it was like a week really so i had a little liverpool signed ball by i think it was like their youth under 17 team or something like that that's cool Um, and i was like okay that's the one i want and they were not that good at the time they had just won the champions league in 2005 Mm -hmm. but when uh uh, the deal was signed i want to say it was like 2007 2008 Mm -hmm. and a lot of the liverpool players had been sold um and they weren't that good they were struggling so they were getting like seventh and eighth and stuff so it wasn't until recently really that liverpool has become the powerhouse that it has uh that it was right and of course this season like we're riddled with injuries and we just got knocked out of the champions league uh today and we're battling for like fourth place in mm-hmm. the league which 
which is important to get top four. Right. Um, so it's been a real struggle, but we won the league last year, won the champions league the year before that. So I can't really complain. There you go. That's when, you know, a true fan, even when you're not doing great, you're like still on my back though. Yeah. And it's, um, I, I want to get into MLS and I want to go, I think, you know, once the stadiums are back, I, I would love to go to an LAFC game. I hear the stadium is amazing mm-hmm. um, and they're pretty decent, but MLS as a whole is just terrible to watch. It's like, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> it's like wreck kids, you know, that just like crowd around the ball. Right. If you know, when you watch little kids and everybody's yep. just running at the ball and just like kicking it around, that's what MLS is to me. Yeah. It's just <laughs> terrible, terrible. <laughs> Have you seen Liverpool like play in person? I did. They came to San Francisco. Nice. And my brother got me tickets um, and they played AC Milan or Inter nice. Milan. One of the Milans. Mm-hmm. I think it was AC. And we won three to one. Um, Dude. But it was a summer. It was a summer game. So like the full squad wasn't, you know, they take breaks and stuff like that. So we had a right. lot of the newer players, but it was still fun. Yeah. Um, it was in the 49ers stadium and that stadium is really nice. Nice. It was, it was a good game, so I can't complain. And you won. The, yeah, and, but the dream is obviously to go to a game at Anfield, which right, of course. Supposedly, I'm sure as your friend that's a Manchester United fan would mm-hmm. say, like it. That's the penultimate experience going yep. to Anfield, um, and you know, singing "You'll Never Walk Alone" with fifty thousand other people. That's, yeah, I'm sure I'll cry. Yeah, <laughs> and rightfully so. And rightfully so. That's nuts, though, to have such a personal connection as well on this side of the pond. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just super happy to be be able to actually super happy to just be able to watch it because a sure. lot of the other leagues are very hard. Um, mm-hmm. It's taken a while. NBC hasn't been the easiest. You used to have to have like a gold pass. Mm-hmm. You could only watch them on your iPad. Now they're starting to be games on uh, actual TV, but then now that Peacock's around, they're trying to like shift a lot of the games to to there. Sure. And C- CBS has uh, the Champions League, so you have to have Paramount Plus to watch the Champions League. Ah, uh, of course, of course. I think that's a real problem with, especially being an American trying to watch any other league. You have to have like ten different things to watch the games. Yeah. So you get on the West Coast. Bundle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oh, yeah. on the West Coast, the games are at 4 a.m. sometimes. Oh, ah. When, when I lived in San Diego, we would go watch a game. Um, like we would, there's four, 4 a.m. games, 6 a.m. games. Right. And um, the Liverpool bar in San Diego is called the Princess Pub. Nice. And um, you would get there, you know, at 5 30, whatever the game would start, and they would ring a bell at 6 a.m. And that meant you could go and get a pint. And so everybody would go and get a pint. Oh, cool. And you'd have breakfast. It's like a, just a different way to um, experience sports, waking up at 6 a.m., having a beer and like having a breakfast burrito. As you, that like, sounds like the best thing ever. What? Yeah. And you're done by 10 a.m. And then yeah, you go of take course. a nap. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, my buddy is a, the same way. Would wake up super, super early to watch them all. When the World Cup comes around, he watches every single game. Like all of them, he watched like sixty games in the last yeah. one. I was like, "Ooh, I do like." I don't even know if we're gonna qualify. I don't yeah. think we have. <laughs> Which will be two World Cups in a row that we have not qualified in. Yeah, I like the World Cup a lot. I just think it's cool that countries are battling it out. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it's gonna be in Qatar in in next year, so that'll be very interesting. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. I like it. I always describe soccer like watching soccer. It's like. Imagine football, but there's an interception every like three seconds. It's just back and forth and going around. And like, it's so hard to score that when you do, you're like, oh, this is great. I it's love very it. rewarding. Um, yeah. And obviously there's some disappointment when you have, like we tied Real Madrid today, 0-0. Mm-hmm. But um, in Champions League, um, in the knockout stages, you have a home and away game. Yep. So you play one at, yeah. And then uh, we had lost to them 3-1. So we needed to win 2-0 today to move on, but we didn't. We couldn't get a goal. Yeah, that's how it goes sometimes. Scoring's pretty difficult. Well, especially when you're in Liverpool right now. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And uh, I, I know recently you've started doing Twitch stuff. How's that been? I haven't had time to do it in the past couple of weeks. I went on a little mini vacation once we got vaccinated to like celebrate. So we went Hell up yeah. to Washington and saw some mountains and stuff and it was very beautiful. Get it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to to Twitch stream Star Wars games because it just seems to be my Twitter audience and I'm trying to Why not? cater to my audience right now. Sure. Um, Those games are pretty uh, good. I reinstalled uh, the Old Republic and Ooh, have been yep. playing through the Bounty Hunter story because when I first played the Old Republic a long, 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 long time ago, I played a smuggler and then a trooper. Nice. And didn't really touch anything else. Mm-hmm. And each class has its own like very unique, distinct story. Mm-hmm. Um, and with Mandalorian, I was like, oh, I want to do a bounty hunter. Nice. So um, I've been doing that. I've, it's what's his name? It's like Canyon Danity or something like that. It's like a, just a rearranging <laughs> of my name. Perfect. <laughs> In proper Star Wars fashion. And the dialogue is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and you, I'm just making him try to be as like, as big of an asshole as possible. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Are you good at it? Um, it's not difficult. Like you press like two buttons and yeah, the thing dies. So it's, <laughs> it's uh, like <laughs> any helps. MMO it's like for the first, probably like 50 levels, it's really not hard. And sure. so, so you just kind of fly through it at this point. Okay. Okay. I'm terrible at video games. So I also don't have that competitive edge where like, if I die like six times in a row, I quit. I was like, I think I'm good. But there are people that are like, no, I'm going to get through this. I'm like six. If I'm lucky, yeah. I'll make it six <laughs> times. <laughs> that was like squadrons for me. That game was impossible. I yeah. played it for like one week and I was like, nope, this game's not for me. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. But it's also- MMOs, honestly, you would like it's They're very um, friendly. It's not like, technically skilled it's like you target something and then hit one two three four in that order and by the time you get through the fourth rotation of that it's dead that that helps that helps but it probably makes it easier as well to interact with chat as well because i I can't multitask i'm like i'm picking one i'm either playing or i'm talking i can't do both (laughs) uh in those games like chat really helps you like figure things out there's a couple people that watch my stream that um i mean at, at most, I have like maybe five or six people because I've just kind still. of started. Yeah, um, that's good. They'll, they'll, I was like, how do I do this? And they're like, oh, no, just do this and this and this. And I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. All right. <laughs> so you it's like having your own. Days. Yeah, it's <laughs> like having your own little, little interactive guidebook with you. So it's sure. Great. Is there a formula for events that like you can follow that like if somebody wanted to get into events like what's a piece of advice you would give them to be like remember this because here's a common plot hole that a lot of people stumble into well there is a if you're in high school if your listeners are in high school some of them potentially oh, i'm sorry um, guys if you are <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a couple of universities that actually offer um event degrees now oh really Yeah, I think Baylor is one of them Um, in Waco. There's a couple other ones that have some kind of like form of of that. It's like a hospital. Like, did you remember like hospitality? Like hotels? Yep. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. It's like an offshoot of that, but it's events. That makes sense. Um, So you can go that route. And then honestly, I think the only other route other than that is um, to get some kind of entry job because there is no, I, I feel like most people I meet in events, that's not like what their career path that they intended to have is. Sure. sure. They just kind of are organized or creative or um, kind of have something that events can cater to, you know, uh, creatively or, or their background slightly. And then they're mm-hmm. like, oh, I just dabbled in this. And then 10 years later, I'm still here. Right. Right. You know, my, my boss, Esty, he was, he had a film background. So obviously oh, cool. ended up in film, but that he really his his route to Luke's film was through AV. So he worked for an AV company uh, for a long time and set up audiovisual stuff for them at events and things like that. And then like worked his way up and now he's over at Facebook. Um, but um, Mary Franklin, like 
her story is amazing. She has a TED talk. If you haven't seen it, you can go mm-hmm. watch it. It's great. Um, but she ran like a community, um, oh my gosh, like forum, a Star Wars forum online. Mm-hmm. That's how she got her start. So she, so she Nuts. went at um, events from like the fandom start uh, point of view. So she just helped facilitate fandom online. And that turned into um, Steve um, Rancho Obi-Wan, Steve. Sansweet. Yeah, Sansweet. There we go. Um, mm-hmm. Basically hired her to help with the first celebration because she knew a lot about the different fandoms and, and clubs and things like that. And then that's how she got her start. So you just never um, know. Yeah. I don't think there's any one particular, I guess that's the nice thing about events. There's not one particular way to get there. Sure. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> help that there's not an easy answer to that because yeah, yeah, you can't just like go to med school and become um, an event person. It's right. Like uh, I would recommend getting maybe a marketing background because okay. a lot of what we do is marketing based um, or potentially like definitely having Photoshop skills helps. Um, we, at least at Lucasfilm, we were a two person team. So we had to wear a lot of different hats, um, mm-hmm. you know, f- whether that was operating BB-8, you know, for commercials right. and things like that, or um t-shirt designs you know like merchandise designs um anything that helped us like not have to reach out to another person like those kinds of skills right like knowing how to photoshop or um my boss was really good at it's like a knockoff version of autocad so he could kind of like sketch uh it's called sketchup there we go oh um it's there's like a free version online and so he was good at like building the booth out kind of and then we would hand it off to the building companies that would like use that to make oh, the actual thing that's so, cool um it's it's like being a renaissance man almost in a lot of, uh, a lot yeah. of ways because most companies their event teams are very small um, mm-hmm. and very lean and they don't have the resources to you know get all these different things that like big normal departments have right right that makes sense it's like try to be as multifaceted as you can that way you yep. can offer so much more. That makes sense. That makes sense. Which, so that's that's not really an answer, but it is an answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's kind of how all entertainment works. There's really no right way to do anything. You just sort of do your best and like try to be as good as you can at the things you're good at. And then it's sort of a square peg finds a square hole eventually. Mm-hmm. It's like persistence. My, yeah. My one advice to most people is network as much as you can. Yeah. And be nice to as many people as you can. For real. Go, it, it goes simple, so far. <laughs> but yeah, um, it, it's so true. It's so small. I, I yeah. find that as well as from like an acting standpoint as well. It's like it's once you see past the curtain, it is so small back there. Everybody yeah. knows everybody. And it's like, just just be nice. <laughs> it goes How so I got far. my team liquid job was just somebody on Twitter. I, I didn't know my bo- my current boss. Uh-huh. Um, but somebody of uh, a uh, Twitter mutual did, and my boss posted a tweet basically asking for like, Hey, who knows somebody in events, they tagged me in it. I sent her my resume. Wow. And that's how I got on team liquid. That's amazing. You just never know. You just it, yep. do, do the work and be nice. <laughs> and you never know. Luckily, and luckily in events, it's so easy to meet so many different people. So, right. Right. You're literally coordinating. <laughs> the meats <laughs> yeah. and i mean what i did at celebration you know was i ran the tattoo pavilion i ran oh, artist sweet. alley i Perfect. helped with the podcasting stages mm-hmm. um the fan panels like all that stuff and obviously through doing that you know just in the things that i've listed that's there's like a thousand people there yeah yeah and you're nice so you have a connection <laughs> <laughs> yeah just be nice to people it, it really does go a long way I think so. I think so. I think that's a great landing as well. It's it's universal advice. Yeah. <laughs> Just, if you take anything away from this, it's that Manchester United sucks and be nice. <laughs> it's my two mantras. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's worked out. It's worked out. Yeah. <laughs> but dude, 
this was a blast. I can't believe you said yes. <laughs> this is my first podcast. Is it really? Yeah, wow. I've never done one. Man, I don't know if if this is a good standard to have. <laughs> it's been easy. Like it's just talking. So yeah, that's right. You survived. I'll give you that. You get a badge that should come in the mail one day, um, and it'll just say you survived, and then it'll have a cabbage on it, and well done. But dude, thank you for hanging out with me. This was awesome. Yeah. No problem. I know I say um a lot. So um, oh man, you can dude. and I just did it. <laughs> you have so no. if you can just edit those out, <laughs> that would be great. My uh to to put you at ease a little bit, my last I never get reviews for anything ever on like Apple Podcasts or anything, but somebody left one a few months ago and it just said the host says um there you go way too much. It was distracting. <laughs> and I for sure said it multiple times here. Yeah. So you're good. You're good. <laughs> Ash has been on like uh you know a billion podcasts. So she uh she was like, just watch your ums. She prepped you. <laughs> that was her prep. Just basically Perfect. watch your ums. She's like, you know how Brian is, just 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 go with it. Whatever he says, just yes and <laughs> she was like, Do you have any questions for me? And I was like, uh, I don't know. I don't really no. know. I don't know what to expect. So zero. Um, if this is what <laughs> podcasting is, I see why people you know, everybody starts up one for some various topic because they're like, oh, you just stop it, talk about that topic all day. Yep. This podcast, I think, is cool and unique because um, it changes week to week. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. As somebody that is always looking for like, I get like ADHD as far as like what I am into. Sure. This is the podcast for that. Awesome. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. So before I let you go, I have to ask, where can people find you online and see your awesome art? Yeah. Um, Instagram is just Daniel Kennedy. Um, Perfect. I've been on Instagram for a while, so I got my actual name, which is nice. Uh, nice. I have a very common name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to be first. That's it. <laughs> Twitter is just Daniel Kennedy DK. Perfect. And that's really, oh, and Twitch, I guess. Um, yep. It's TLD, like underscore DK. That's and, um, amazing. I'm going to try to, my goal, I finally got my desk set up which is what you're seeing here, but mm -hmm. um, I got a nice little Alienware laptop that work gave me and, and nice. um, a nice camera. So I'm going to, the goal is to start making streaming um, an actual thing. Cool. I, I like it. Yeah. Why not? Um, yeah. So, I'm into that. I'm into that. Those three places. That's kind of where I exist. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. And Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>